Welcome to Pathway Church's online service. I'm Ryan Wolf, And I'm Jill Harper, and we're your online hosts today. Glad to have you here today, Jill. It's great to be here, Ryan, and we're excited that you all have decided to join us. You know, Pathway Church is one church with many locations around Sedgwick County. As you can see on the screen below, we have locations in Goddard, Valley Center, and West Wichita. That's right, and we want to personally invite you to visit us at one of our locations. When you arrive, friendly people will be ready to greet you and guide you to the coffee and snacks and then on into service. After service, don't miss an opportunity to stop by the new to Pathway table to introduce yourself to our campus pastor and tell them we invited you. They would love to meet you. And I think that's their favorite part of the weekend. Oh, it definitely is. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Another way to connect with us is to send us a text. We would love to know you're here today. So just text the word NEW to 316 316- 444-4180. It's a simple way for you to let us know you're here, and it opens the door for us to answer any questions you may have, help you find a location, and to get you hooked up with our app. Yeah, and if you're watching us for the first time, I want to let you know that we have a library of previous messages, all conveniently available on demand. These messages cover a range of topics and are a great way to get a sense of what our community is all about. Feel free to explore them at your own pace. I'm excited for what we're going to learn today in today's message. Are you ready for it? I'm definitely ready. All right, let's go. Passing on our faith to the next generation requires deliberate, intentional action. It's about more than just handing over a baton. It's about actively engaging with younger believers, pouring into their lives, and walking alongside them on their journey of faith. Modeling a life of faith becomes not just something we do passively, but something we do intentionally, knowing that young eyes are watching and learning from our example. Sharing our knowledge and experience becomes a deliberate act of mentorship as we seek to equip younger believers with the tools they need to navigate their own faith journeys. And encouraging them to use their gifts becomes a deliberate strategy for empowering them to actively participate in the work of God's kingdom. As we invest in the younger members of our faith community, we can trust that they will continue to run with endurance the race set before them, carrying the torch of faith into the future.
Well, hey, happy Father's Day to all of our dads out there this weekend. Uh, I got to tell you, I love being a dad. I have two kids. My son, Grayson, is eight years old. My daughter, Olivia, she is six. And uh, I tell you, as part of my duty as a father, I feel like part of my responsibility in the household is I am one who is responsible for passing on fun to my kids. And I think the reason that I feel that responsibility is because like this was my dad for me in my home. You know, every Father's Day, my dad only on Father's Day would wear this Hawaiian shirt and he wanted to be referred to as the big kahuna. And so, you know, for me, now that I'm older and I have kids of my own, you can imagine this tradition lives on in my house as well. So there you go. There's a great picture of a couple of big kahunas. Look how good that guy looks, man. That's, you can, you can see where I get my good looks from, right? So I just want to say happy Father's Day to all of our big kahunas out there. Today is your day. You know, it feels good to have a day where you get to be a big deal, right? Where you get to be recognized. And whether it's like Mother's Day or Father's Day or a birthday, it's just, it feels good to be recognized and to be celebrated because we don't always get that so much in life. And my daughter, uh, Olivia, she's at this really fun age where like everything dad does right now, I am immediately like the best thing or the best in the world at that thing. We went out to the lake last week and I uh, grilled some cheeseburgers for us. And so this last week you could hear Olivia around our house saying, daddy makes the best cheeseburgers in the world. And which is like, totally not true. Like they were mediocre. They were fine. They were pretty good. But you know, it's like there's so many times in our lives where we feel like probably where we don't quite measure up, where we feel kind of inadequate. We feel like we're not enough. And so it just feels good that we have one person in our life that says we are enough. You know, we've been in this series called Pass It On, where we've really been talking about how do we pass on faith to the next generation. And I would say anybody that, you know, is a follower of Jesus, there are certain inadequacies, insecurities that we feel about sharing our faith. You know, there's so many things like we we wonder, you know, well, if I share my faith, what if somebody rejects what I say? What if they don't believe me? Or what if I say the wrong things? Or what even are the right things to say? And as we're talking about like passing on faith to the next generation, I think like for parents, all the insecurities that we feel about that, there's an extra layer of insecurity as a parent. And if you're a parent, you probably know what I mean. Like the insecurities, the parental insecurities, like it starts when your kid is about zero years old. You know, I remember taking my kid home from the hospital and like you barely know what you're doing as a parent, but everybody else has an opinion on what you should be doing as a parent. It's like all the things about how they should sleep, about on their stomach or on their back, you know, it's like breastfeeding versus bottle feeding versus formula, it's sunscreen, no sunscreen, no not that sunscreen, you know, it's like, what do you feed them? Things like chemicals and food dye and all these things that like, as a parent, you're like, I don't know what to do or what the right thing to do is. And I remember when my kids were so young, I just had this feeling, I was like, I'm gonna do one thing wrong and I'm gonna mess my kid up for the rest of their life, right? Like I have to get it right, right now, or it's gonna be the butterfly effect. Like there's no stopping what is gonna be put in motion. I can remember holding my son Grayson on my shoulders when he was so young, and I walked through a door frame, and of course, just, you know, just bam, just smack his poor little head on the door frame. And I'm like, I am the worst parent in the world. Like nobody else does this to their kids. You know, it's, gosh, it's just a lot of pressure as a parent, is it? There's so many insecurities about it that we feel. And you know, I've, I've learned, I know that my kids are, are very resilient and they're bouncy, if you know what I mean, as well. Like, are my kids are gonna be okay if I don't get it right 100% all the time. But there's always this lingering question that I have in the back of my mind as, as a parent, am I doing it right? You know, am I a good parent? You ever ask yourself that? If you have kids, I assume you probably have that question of like, am I a good mom? Am I a good dad? And I tell you, sadly, there's even a piece of me, even when my daughter says, you're the best daddy in the world, there's a piece of me that goes, I don't think so, right? Because I just, 
you know, the insecurity of being like, God, I, I know how imperfect I am. I know how many times I get it wrong, how often I mess up. And so, God, what makes you think that I am the right person to be able to share faith with my kids when I get it wrong so many times? I think for many of us, one of the hardest things about sharing faith really is that failure that we feel. That there have been times in our lives where we know we've, we've made mistakes, we've messed up, we've hurt people, maybe even our kids. And we're trying to figure out how do I share faith with people in the midst? You know, how could someone believe based on maybe some of the things that I've done? For some of you, I know you're trying to share faith in your home. And you didn't have parents that, that really modeled that for you. Or, or what that looked like. And so you probably feel pretty alone in trying to figure out how do I share faith with my kids? You know, today to help us out with this, we're going to be looking at the story of Moses. And so if you have your Bibles, I want you to go ahead and turn to Exodus chapter 3. You can follow along with the Pathway app or you can follow along here on the screens. But before we get too far today, I want you to know this. I believe that your imperfection puts you in the perfect place to share who God is with your kids. I want you to hold on to that thought as we go on here tonight. Like I said, we're going to be looking at the story of, of Moses. And if you think about Moses, Moses is like this hero of the Old Testament. You know, he helped lead the people out of slavery in Egypt. He, he crossed the Red Seas with them. You've got the Ten Commandments. He, he takes them to the Promised Land. And so Moses is like this amazing figure in the Old Testament. But when we meet Moses here in Exodus 3, he is really anything but that. You know, Moses, he grew up uh, really in a privileged place in the fact that he was the adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter. But he was an Egyptian. He was adopted. He's an Israelite. And so his whole life, he's, he's grown up with this, this education that he could, you know, just whatever he needed, Moses had from a very, very young age. And as Moses grows up, he, he realized there's a stark difference between his life and the rest of the lives of his people. And it gets to the point where Moses can no longer stand really the injustice, the slavery that his people are facing. One day, he kills an Egyptian slaver. He buries the body in the sand. And when he realizes that he's found out, he flees for the desert. He flees for this whole other country. He tries to get away from his past to be able to start a new life. And so he begins to start over. He has, um, he has a wife. He has kids. He thinks he's finally away from his life there in Egypt. But one day while he's out shepherding his sheep, he sees this bush that's burning, yet it's not being consumed. And as Moses goes to investigate, God speaks to Moses, and he says, Moses, you're going to be the one that are going to lead my people out of Egypt. But for Moses, he's really like for us today, facing these feelings of inadequacy, feeling like it should be anybody else but him. So let's look at here at Exodus chapter 3, verse 9. This is God speaking. It says, Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abused them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people Israel out of Egypt. But Moses protested to God, who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? You know, Moses, I mean, he, he asked God right away. He says, how can I be the one that's responsible to do this? I think Moses for himself, he's probably recounting right away. Like he's remembering, he's like, I, I killed a man back in Egypt. And when I got found out, I mean, I was a coward. I ran away and I've been trying to put this entire life behind me as much as I can. And he's like, now, God, you want me to go back there? You want me to relive that? You really think that after what I've done, I'm the best person to go and to send that message? And I know for us today, as we've already talked about, you know, when it comes to our own failures, I think, you know, like Moses has this bloody past, and there's plenty of us that we feel that we kind of have this bloody past as well. You know, we know that we haven't always probably followed God the best of our ability in our lives, that there's times where we have made mistakes, we have hurt people, we may have hurt our kids, and, and there's things behind us that we would rather forget and not have to revisit. And so we see all these things, and, and we're like, God, how could in the midst of those things that I have done in my life, how do you feel like I could be the right one to take the message of who you are to someone else? I feel like the least qualified person 
in the world. But you know, God is, what he's saying here to Moses, God tells Moses in the very next verse, he says, Moses, I will be with you. What God is trying to help Moses do, he's saying, Moses, I need you to take some of the pressure off of yourself because the fact that I'm calling you and using you to to lead the people out of Israel is not because you are perfect. It is not because you are wonderful, but because I am. I am God. I am perfect. I am wonderful. And I don't need you to be God for these people. I simply need you to be willing to be obedient to go and send the message. You know, God tells Moses here, one of the first things that he says to Moses as, as he starts this conversation with him, we, we understand, like, this is the first time that Moses has ever heard God speak in his life. And so part of what God is doing is he's trying to introduce himself to Moses so Moses understands who God is. And God says to Moses, he says, I have seen and I have heard the cries of my people in Egypt. And I think it's easy to hear that and be like, well, yeah, you know, God is an all-powerful, all-knowing God. Of course he hears that. He's got a plan to take care of that. Moses is part of that plan. But this isn't simply God just stating that he sees something. What, Moses, or what God is really doing here for Moses is he is trying to appeal to Moses' heart. He says, Moses, remember that thing back in Egypt? That injustice that you faced? That thing that was so unbearable for you that you killed a man over it? God says, I want you to know I see that. I care about that, Moses, more than you do. And I am actually the only one that has power to change life and reality for those Israelites there in Israel. Like, I want to accomplish what you wish you could have done, right? And as we're talking today, you know, we're talking in the context of how do we pass on faith to our kids. There's, there's an important truth here for, for us to figure out, right? Like, I can remember the first time that I ever held my son. I was like, oh my gosh, like I loved him from the moment that I saw him. And then like, I was like, I'd do anything for this kid. Like I will pull a Moses, I will kill a man if I have to for this kid. If it comes down between them and the kid, like it's the kid, right? And I remember as I sat there and I, and I held my son, it was like this light bulb moment for me. I was like, oh my gosh, like I get it. I understand God the Father in a way that I never really knew him before. You know, I'd always been told God loves me like a father, but it was a new way that I, that I understood it. I, I, really, I really got it. And I understood how much God loves me. And if you're a parent today and you have kids, I think there's something that we have to accept is that God loves and cares about our kids more than we do. Feels impossible right? Like, no way. No one cares about our kids more than us. But God does. And God fills a very important role in the lives of our kids that we simply cannot. You know, for us as parents, we are trying the best that we can always to give our kids the best life that they can possibly have. But ultimately, when it comes down to it, there is a life, there is a fulfillment that only God can give them. And so God is is saying to Moses, And he's saying to us, he's saying, I don't need you to be God for them. He's saying, I am the only one that really can bring the freedom and the life that they need. But what I need you to do is I need you to be obedient to go and take the message to them. Moses has a lot more questions about this. He's got a few more questions that he asked God. So I want you to check out this next one here in verse 13. But Moses protested, if I go to the people of Israel and tell them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask me, what is his name? Then what should I tell them? God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So Moses here is like, if if I go to these people and I tell them God has spoken to me, like how do I start telling them who in the world is? you are. And if you've ever tried to teach Sunday school or teach like the Bible to very young kids, I think you start to understand like Moses's angst here, right? Like how do you start explaining an infinite, all-powerful, all-knowing, invisible God to like a six-year-old, okay? It's like we've got big God and our kids have tiny underdeveloped brains, okay? Like they're still trying to figure out, they're still developing and growing. But God says here, he's like, you're going to explain it in the sense of, of I 
am. You know, something that we have to understand here, like we said before, this is the first time that God has, has spoken to Moses. Moses grew up with this, this Egyptian education, and so the idea of a God is not new to Moses. He grew up with a pantheon of gods that he would have learned about, that he would have worshipped probably there in Egypt. And so what God is trying to do for Moses is he is trying to separate himself from the crowd. That he wants Moses to understand he is the one true God, the only God for him. And so even for like us, for parents and, and grandparents and those of us that are trying to help the next generation understand who God is, you know, we know this for our kids there are a bunch of competing voices in their life, right? All kinds of things that are promising life and freedom and satisfaction that in the end they cannot give. God is the only one that can give that. So how do we help the voice of God rise above the rest? And what God says to Moses, he says, go to the Israelites and tell them, I am who I am. Tell them I am sent you. And I don't know about you, I remember reading that for the first time and I was like, I am, like you are what? Like it feels like this, kind of like this this incomplete sentence, like God, I am a lot of things. What exactly are you? But you know, a lot has been made about this verse, especially in our, like our Western philosophical thinking, that part of what God is doing here with Moses is he is stating his existence. I am, before time was, and after ever will be is God. God is the same Yesterday, today, tomorrow, forever, God is. He is the existing one, right? And this is different too from the rest of the gods of like the, of the pantheon of Egyptian gods where they had a god of like the sun, the moon, farm animals, all kinds of things that they had, they had God for. God saying, I am the ever existing one. I am the God over everything. But when you think back about the, the Israelites, you know, these Israelites who are living under the oppression and the whip of the Egyptians, you know, I think it's not enough for these Israelites to just know that God exists, right? But they need to know that God is present, that God is with them, that God has power to be able to change the reality that they're facing. So I want you to understand this, you know, as we're sharing our faith, if we're trying to tell about the next generation about who God is, Our job is more than to simply try to convince our kids that God exists. But part of our job is starting to point our kids towards the power and the presence that God has in their lives. It's not just I am in the sense of I exist. It is a manifested existence, a God who actually has the power to change their world around them. Look at this next question that Moses asks here in chapter 4, verse 1 says, but Moses protested again. What if they won't believe me or listen to me? What if they say the Lord never appeared to you? You know, Moses asked this question, I think all of us fear at some point when, when we share our faith. What if I'm faithful and I'm, I'm obedient and I go and I share and they don't believe me? What if they say no? What if they, what if they reject it? And, and I'd be honest with you, I think one of my greatest fears as a parent is I know I'm going to do everything that I can to raise my kids in a godly home where they know that God loves them and I love them. But I have to live with the reality that at the end of the day, my kids are their own kids. And there is a possibility that someday they will choose to reject that message. And I tell you, I have so many friends that I know, some of the best followers of Jesus I know that they are living in this reality, that they have, they have their own kids that have, have chosen to either reject that message or walk away from faith or, or however you want to say it. And so in the midst of, of that fear or that reality for some of us, the question is, God, how do I really share who you are, that you are present, that you are powerful, that you have the ability to, to change their lives, the freedom that you desire to give them? How do I explain that to them? And what God does here for Moses is he gives them these, these three miracles. So the first one is like Moses can take a staff and he can throw it on the ground. It becomes a snake and he can pick it back up and it's a staff again. And the second one that he gives them is uh, he can make leprosy form on his hand. He can put it in his clothes, comes back completely healed. 
And the third is this where Moses can turn water into blood. And I read that, I'm like, oh God, how great would it be if you would just give me like a miracle that I could just perform and they'd get it, right? Like next time my kids are arguing and they're not obeying and listening, I'm gonna throw the broom on the ground, it's gonna become a snake, and then we're gonna see how quick they listen to mom and dad, right? Like that'll, that'll put the fear of God into them that they need, right? But unfortunately, we, we, don't, we don't have that gift. God has not given us a miracle that we can, we can just show our kids. But you know, when you look at the, the story of the Exodus, you have these, you have these miracles, you have, you have the 10 plagues that, that God performs. And I want us to focus not on the miracles, but what God is trying to do with those miracles. You see, every time that God has one of those miracles or, or he brings a plague against the people of Egypt, what God is doing every time is God is stacking his presence, his power, and who he is up against one of the gods of Egypt. And again, and again, and again, God is showing these things that you worship, these things that you put your faith in, these things that you put your trust in, they are nothing compared to who I am as God. I am present. I am powerful. I am here with you. I am for you. And you need to stop putting your faith and your trust in those things and start putting your faith and your trust in me. And this is the same challenge for us with, with our kids, you know, as we talked about all these competing voices that they have in the world, these things that promise to give them life and satisfaction that in the end cannot. They need to see the example of God's power in our lives, the presence that he has to understand that none of those things stand up to who God is. This is why I said earlier, I, I believe your imperfection puts you in the perfect place to share who God is with the kid in your life. Because God is saying, I don't need you to be God. I don't need you to be perfect necessarily. I want you to be a good role model, of course. But God is saying, ultimately, it's gonna be through my work, my grace, my power in your life that your children will start to understand who I am as a God. You know, my wife and I, we were talking about this last week. We were 25 when we started having kids. Our kids are eight and six now. And our kids are watching us grow up just as much as we are watching them grow up. They're watching us grow up. How do we develop as a mom and dad? Are we forgiving? Are we merciful? Are we learning to obey and trust God in new ways? Are we continuing to grow in our life? Our kids are trying to understand who God is really through the lens of us. And they're not going to understand because mom and dad get it right and are perfect and do the right things all the time. But they're going to understand because of the work that God does in us to make us more gracious, more merciful, to be able to see God and his work and his power really in us. So that's what it means for us to be obedient to the message. That as we make our lives, we make ourselves more and more obedient to who God is, that our kids see the work and power that God can do. And they can see, man, if God can do that in mom or grandpa, or God can do that in Uncle Steve, or if God can do that in my teacher or my coach, whoever, they say, God can do that in my life as well. So the trick for us now is saying, you know, if this is what it is, how do we stay in the fight with our kids? Look at this last question that Moses asked God here. Verse 10, but Moses pleaded with the Lord, oh Lord, I'm not very good with words. I never have been and I'm not now. Even though you've spoken to me, I get tongue-tied and my words get tangled. Then the Lord asked Moses, who makes a person's mouth? Who decides whether people speak or do not speak, hear or do not hear, see or do not see? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will be with you as you speak and I will instruct you in what to say. You know, one of the hardest things about sharing our faith is this like feeling of like, I don't want to say something wrong, right? I want to represent God well. I I don't want to misrepresent him. You know, I don't want to say anything that would push somebody like further from faith. But you know, I think something that, that we need to do collectively is let ourselves not feel so responsible to always 
answer for God. Or even to just feel like we have all the answers, if you know what I mean. Like, I don't want us to just say that we should live blissfully ignorant, that we should never ask hard questions of God because I don't believe that's right. But I think, you know, what, I, what I've discovered is that, you know, when I'm, when I'm speaking with someone about who God is, and especially with my kids, what I've learned is that the conversation is more important than being right. The fact that I would take time to be able to sit, to listen to someone, to hear what they're going through, to show care, that those things oftentimes speak a thousand times louder than just giving a cold answer, right? It's kind of like the old, I told you so, as a parent, which we all use from time to time. Or just saying, well, because God said so. And I don't want to mean to say that in the sense that we should never seek after truth and that truth is not important. But what is important is this time where we get to be able to sit and have conversation with our kids. And really, when we do this, that we are modeling for them who God is. That we know as as followers of Jesus that no matter what we do, no matter how far we go the opposite direction of who God is and the best for God or the best uh, God has for us in our life, no matter how far we step away from that, we can always come back. It's like the story of the prodigal son. God is always waiting for open arms with us. We know that he loves us no matter what. And as parents, that, that we have to figure out how to do this as well, to make sure that no matter what decisions our kids will make, right? My kids are young, so they haven't made any really stupid decisions yet, but the teenage years are coming, right? And no matter what choices they make, even when they choose the things that is not God's best for them, even when they do things that will drive me up the wall and break my heart, no matter how far they go, they can always come back to mom and dad. They always know that we're going to love them, that that we're going to be there for them, and we're going to be there to have the conversation. And so this is what I really want to encourage you to do, man. We have to figure out how we can stay in the fight with our kids. We have to stay in the conversation. And so that's why all month here and, and through this series, Pass It On, I mean, this has been our I will statement. This has been what we want to commit to for the next week. It's simply this. I will have a five-minute intentional conversation with the kid in my life. Just five minutes. Taking time to really sit and listen to our kids about what is going on in life. What are you scared of right now? What are you excited about? What's going on within your friends? And in those conversations and in those moments that we get a chance to listen to them, then as parents, grandparents, coaches, aunts, uncles, whatever position you find yourself in, then you have these moments where you can start pointing them to God's presence, his power, the work that he's doing in your life and in their life, and the things that God is working around them to start helping them see and understand who God is. Man, we want to help you guys really, really do this. And so one of the things that we have is we have this parent page that we have uh, dedicated on our website. You can also find it there in the Pathway app. But we'd love for you to go and check this out. One of the things that we have on there is just some conversation starters for you. We have a bunch on there for all kinds of different ages, you know, from, from babies all the way up to seniors in high school to start talking about how can I start engaging in faith conversation with my kids. And I want to encourage you and say this, I know those conversations will not always be perfect, right? I can tell you like just the other day, I'm driving my kids home from their grandparents' house and I was trying to be really good and have one of these conversations and my kids were so wired, I gave up, okay? (laughs) Like it won't be great 100% of the time. But what we're doing is we're creating for our kids this space where they can come back again and again and again to the conversation. You know, I have a, a friend this week, she was telling me her son is, is in our middle school ministry here, and she said, you know, over the last few months, she's been trying these, these conversation starters that we have, and I loved her honesty. It was, it was, her experience was kind of like mine. She's like, I've done a few of those, and not all of them went super well, but she's like, you know, a, a few of those led to some really good faith and life conversations with my son. 
And she said, you know, what amazed her after she started doing that for a few weeks, what happened, it was no longer mom who was always going and initiating those conversations. What happened is her son started coming and asking some really good questions about faith and about life. And she said, honestly, it scared me. Like he asked some questions. She said, I was not prepared to answer, you know, and we will not always have the answers. But she said, you know, what we did is, is we dived into God's word together. We, we processed through that together. She says, you know, I just, I walked with him through that. And that's the vision that we want to create. You know, as we talk about how do we share faith with the next generation, these five minute conversations, it is really taking the time to be intentional to walk with our kids day after day after day, saying, I'm gonna take every moment I can to just, to be intentional. Just five minutes, five minutes a day. You could be on the way to school. I mean, it's summer, so not that. Maybe on the way to pool, on the way to the grandparents, out wherever you may be going to Target or wherever you're shopping. But if you'll just be obedient, these turn from moments to holy moments where God is going to use you. He will give you the words. He'll help you know what to say. He'll help tell you when you need to shut your mouth and listen. God will be there with you in that. But it's not because you and I are going to be perfect role models and perfect parents, but it's because we're going to be imperfect that God is putting us in the perfect place to share who he is with our kids. So we're going to take a moment here and we're going to pray. What I want you to do is I want you to bow your heads with me right now. If you just do that, join me in prayer. And as we've been listening today, you know, if God is is working in your heart to say, God, I want you to use me to share who you are with the next generation. If you're willing to admit to go to to go this week and and just say, I'm each day, I'm going to try to have that five five minute conversation with the kid that God has placed in my life. If you're willing to do that, I just want you to raise your hand just as a sign of obedience to say, God, I will go this week. I will be obedient. I will go. I will have that conversation. I'm willing to do that for the kid in my life this week. Awesome. Me too. Let me pray for us. God, I just thank you for my brothers and sisters. Lord, you're doing an awesome work in us, God. Lord, we know that we are so far from perfect, but God, your grace is sufficient enough for us. Lord, that we understand that you are made perfect in our weakness. Lord, that you shine through. And so God, we just pray, Lord, that you would use us this week to go and have those conversations. Lord, may your Holy Spirit speak boldly to us about when is the right time to share a certain truth or God, the right time to to close our mouth and just to listen and be present with our child. But God, knowing and trusting as, as we do that, Lord, that who you are, your power and your presence ultimately is the one that shines through. We're gonna keep our heads bowed here and, and I wanna go into a moment here that I wanna say this, if, if you've been listening today and you realize, man, you need the life that only God can give. That as God, just as he wanted to lead the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt, God wants to lead you to a freedom and a life that you can't even comprehend yet. And if you realize that's something that you need and you want to make the decision to follow Jesus today, then I just want to invite you in the quietness of your heart to say this simple prayer with me. Let me guide you. God, I know that I am a sinner. But God, I believe that you have sent your son, Jesus, to be the price for my sin. Lord, that I can be forgiven that I can experience the grace and the forgiveness and the life that you give. And so God, as much as I understand right now, I choose to follow you. I choose to trust you and make myself obedient to you for the life that you give. As everyone keeps their heads bowed, if, if you said that prayer today as a sign to God, I just wanna invite you now, if you said that prayer for the first time to raise your hand, to show God, I, I've made that decision. I'm ready for the life that you give. I'm, I'm ready to follow you. Awesome, let me pray for you. God, I thank you for my new brother, Lord, who for the first time, God, is, is putting his faith and his trust in you. Lord, experiencing the life that only you can give. 
So God, we just thank you again for the gift of Jesus. Lord, the ultimate gift. And God, the privilege that we get to be able to pass that down to the next generation. God, may you continue to lead us and guide us. And only by your spirit, Lord, will we be able to share with them who Jesus is. It's in Jesus' name that we pray all these things. Amen. If you made a decision to accept Jesus as your personal Savior today, we want you to know that you are not alone. Our team of caring staff and volunteers want to walk alongside you as you begin your faith journey. So please reach out, let us know so we can connect with you, get you a Bible if you need one, and answer any questions you may have. Go to pathwaychurch.com forward slash decision to let us know. And remember, this is just the beginning. We are so excited about your new relationship with Jesus and would love to celebrate with you. At Pathway, we believe no one is too far from God or unable to take one simple step towards Him. We truly hope you discovered something meaningful during our time together. So whether you've got a story to share, a prayer request, or any questions, remember, we would love to connect with you. Thank you for joining us today.
and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children, and their children May His presence go before you And behind you, and beside you All around you, and within you He is with you, He is with you In the morning, in the evening In your coming, and your going In your weeping, and rejoicing He is for you, He is for you
say